What's up, guitar players? Are you ready to hear from Richie Kotzen? Of course you are. But before we start, I'd like to tell you all about an awesome guitar website called guitarplayback.com. This website has all the vitamins and nutritions that every growing guitarist needs, from jam tracks to video lessons, map tracks, and more. Check out guitarplayback.com and enter in the coupon code PODCAST at checkout for 50% off your next order. That's guitarplayback.com. Ignite your musical personality. Welcome to Entertainment Drive Through. Today's special is Richie Cotton from the Winery Docks. Quiet on the set. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage. Hello, hello, welcome to Entertainment Drive Through. I'm Anna, with me is my co-host Dan, and today we have a very special guest. He's known as the guitarist for bands such as Poison, Mr. Big, and now he's currently touring with the Winery Dogs with Mike Portnoy and Billy Sheehan. Joining us is the one, the only, Richie Cotton! Yeah! Welcome Woo! to the show! Alright! Yeah, <laughs> thanks for having me. Absolutely! How's it going? It was very, very good. Uh, having a great time touring with the Winery Dogs, and uh, they were really having a great time out here on the road. That's wonderful. Tell us a bit about yourself. I mean, how did you get started? Uh, personally, I, I started playing when I was very young, actually. I remember when I was a little kid, probably around five years old, uh, I was one of those kids who was always trying to put on little concerts and dressing up, uh, you know, playing a make-believe guitar, and finally <laughs> someone in the family suggested piano lessons, and ah. so started that, and I didn't really take to it, um, but shortly, a few years after that, I saw a guitar at a yard sale, and I realized that that's the instrument that I wanted to learn, Right. Nice. so we, uh, they got me a, a guitar, and I started taking private lessons, and then everything just kind of went from there. I started my first band in seventh grade, mm -hmm. and uh, we played at a couple high school dances, and... Uh, your little local fairs and stuff like that. And just kind of went from there. I think nice. it's so funny. Every time people talk about how they started off on piano, like you hear all the time, people are, are talking about how they started, like you ask them how much their first guitar was and they say, oh, you know, got it 50 bucks at a pawn shop. <laughs> oh, you know, got it this place, this place for cheap. But their parents wanted to buy a piano, which was like a thousand dollars more. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, you know, we actually had a piano in the house that nobody really played and when I when I started lessons my dad started at the same time just so that you know to kind of keep me interested I suppose uh, and then he continued you. on with it he, he continued his lessons after I stopped can't really play now anymore because it was a long time ago but yeah. um yeah you know we, we had the piano and they figured well might as well uh start somewhere <laughs> right. I gotcha and when is that moment that you decided that being a musician is exactly what you wanted to be you know it wasn't going to be training dogs to guard a winery <laughs> you wanted to be a musician yeah right well you know it was pretty instant um, the minute I got into the guitar it was one of those things where I looked forward to the lesson and I loved to, to play and practice and so it, it was pretty instant um, you know and then from there I, I started playing in bands, and by the time I was 15, I was in a full-time cover band and playing four nights a week and oh. uh, make, making money, too, you know, nice. um, and, so that was like in 85, and so I never really did anything other than music because it just kind of went that way. Right. Uh, my father had a, a coin-operated vending business, so... One summer, I went around with him and worked for him and counted quarters, but he actually never paid me, so <laughs> it's not really working. You know, like a chore, like a chore I had to do. But really, you know, the music thing just kind of clicked, and that's the direction I went in. Yeah, and I mean, since then, you've had... I mean, you've become quite a quite a monster at the guitar. And, you know, I mean, one of the things that actually... Me, personally, I, I've picked up a lot from, you know, from your pay, playing as... A, as well as other players, is the idea of the hybrid picking. You know, I've noticed you do you tend to do that a lot in your solos. What made you decide to add, you know, using fingers on your right hand to pick as well as using a guitar pick? Um, that kind of came natural to me because of, you know, just 
trying to find ways to play sequences of notes that I was hearing in my head. Mm -hmm. Right. And also the tonality um, changes. So when you, you know, use your fingers, uh, you're talking about using your dick and your fingers, which I've, I've done for a very long time. Yeah. So, you know, you get the tonal variation. Now, at this point, uh, live, the last six or seven years, I completely abandoned using the tar picker. Just using my fingers. Oh, really? Yeah. And the, in the interesting thing has been, of course, you get a whole new vocabulary of things that you can play. But, you know, when I first started doing it, I lost a lot of the things that I was doing in the past, like, uh, you know, sweep picking or right. alternate picking. That went out the window. So I had to find ways to play those notes. And it's still in development, but I just felt like I was re-inspired um, by making that change and uh, been able to, you know, get a little more creative and up with some new things that I would not have come up with had I just stayed with the old formula of playing. Right. right. And I think it's so, I mean, you can get un, you can get some really great sounds just from, you know, not even using a pick at all. I mean, you know, you're doing it and, you know, there's another guy, Jared James Nichols, who just destroys the guitar with it. And it's, it's really cool because, you know, everyone thinks, well, you have to use a pick, but I mean, you really don't. Yeah, I mean, all those decisions really have to do with the player and their artistic vision and what it is they want to play. I mean, you know, even on the Weiner Dog record, um, although I don't use a pick live on the record, I did for certain things because I wanted that sound and I wanted you know, certain uh, chords to, to have a certain kind of attack that a pick gives you. I'm using some of the solos, but live I don't use it, and you know, most of what's on that record is just finger playing and being solos. So it's a, it's a decision that you make based on the sound you want to get. Exactly. Absolutely. And now in terms of the winery dogs, how did you guys get the band started? I mean, I understand this is a pretty, I mean, this is a pretty awesome, you know, hard hitting band with, you know, three people from different bands. How did you guys get together to do this? And why the winery dogs? Well, um, we came together, uh, Billy and Mike had, been working with uh, another guitar player, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and for whatever reason, it fell apart, it didn't work, and they still wanted to play together, so uh, they reached out to me, um, and I had already been in a band with Billy and had a lot of fun right. mm -hmm. playing Billy and Mr. Big. Right. I didn't really know Mike, but um, I had met him before, and I, I liked his personality, so we got together in a very small rehearsal room at my house, and... Um, around a bunch of ideas and before we knew it we had written four or five songs and wow. the whole attitude was very much um, let's just see what happens and let it go where it goes and if, if we end up with some music that, that we're excited about then we know we should keep going so that's kind of what happened I gotcha and you said you said you came into the band after they had already started do you know how the name got chosen? Yes um, well I just want to make it clear that it was never a band. In other words, you know, they were working with someone, it fell apart, and then we right. came together. No uh, common commonality between uh, the two situations whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Okay. But as far as the name, my uh, one of my closest friends actually inadvertently named the band. Um, we were struggling, the three of us, to agree on a band name. <laughs> and I was out at dinner one night with him. And he was talking about another uh, situation, friend of his, and he, he he's a musician too, and he wanted to call their group the Winery Dogs. Mm. And I said, my God, I said, that's a great name. Mm -hmm. He's like, yeah, and he told me what, what Winery Dogs are. And after I learned that, it kind of even tied in more. And so I, I pitched the name to Billy and Mike, and, and they liked it, and it sucks, and that was Winery Dogs. Exactly. That's yeah. amazing. Now, how do you write your songs? A couple of different formulas. Um, most of the record is really us getting together, throwing ideas around, and it's as simple as Mike getting behind the drums playing a groove or Billy playing a bass line or mm -hmm. uh, you know, playing a guitar riff. And we would get the songs to a point where they had some form of structure. Mm -hmm. right. And then we would demo them. And then from there, I would go back and try to sing and come up with lyric ideas, um, record that, and send it back to the guys, and they would make suggestions. And that was really the main way we wrote the record. And then there was a handful of songs that I brought in um, that were living on my hard drive 
uh, that needed development. And so we brought those in and turned them into a winery dog songs as well. Right. Yeah. And that was a problem. Very easy process. Really smooth. All right. Well, we're going to take a little break to listen to I'm No Angel by the Winery Dogs. We'll be right back. Now, in terms of, I mean, you've you played with a, a ton of bands now. You know, you've you've gotten a lot of experience on the road in the studio. You know, and and the music business in general. What are things that you've found have worked for you, and things that haven't? You know, in the sense of marketing, getting your name out there, maybe keeping your name out there since you've been around for a while now. You know, what are things that you've found are like people that are getting out there now can learn from. I think the, the biggest thing I've learned is being true to yourself artistically mm-hmm. because most of the miserable experiences I've had uh, around music have been putting myself in a situation that I know something in my heart I don't really want to do. Mm-hmm. Right. And at that point, you move from being a, a, a musical artist into a, a, a theatrical artist where you're acting. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, there's two different art forms. And, and so for me, I think as long as I'm true to, you know, what I really want to do, what I, the music that I want to play, the people I want to play with, mm. that's when I'm inspired. And then I can be productive and, and make music that has a purpose. Right. Uh, as far as the, the business side of things, I mean, that's changed radically oh, yeah. over the years. I was one of these people that was moved to Los Angeles by a major label. And there was a lot of money spent on develop me, developing me as a recording artist. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, it was in a direction that I didn't want to go in. So oh, okay. a lot of the, the negative experiences that I've had kind of revolve around industry kind of trying to, to decorate you in a way that they think you will be more marketable. And I mm-hmm. understand all that because it is a business. However, once the internet came along, for me personally, I was able to make the records that I want to make, the way that I want to make them release them so people can buy them or steal them or whatever it is they're doing to get the music. But that led to a situation where I was able to tour and really define my identity Mm. as a musician, a singer, a songwriter, what have you. So the internet has actually really helped you in terms of of all this? Me personally, yeah. I mean, if it wasn't for that, my career would have completely stalled. And so I'm completely aware of the fact that once, you know, iTunes things like CD Baby, where they actually can make your uh, music available to the public. Right. You know, that happened where you didn't need to go through a, a major corporation. It opened a lot of doors for, you know, artists like myself that already had somewhat of a name, mm-hmm. but just no way to distribute the music. This is exactly. amazing. Now, what, what didn't work, though? 
Are there any deals or something that people should know of that are not good? I think that everything I've done has been very important to give me the perspective and the clarity that I have now. So right. although, you know, I can think about maybe when I got my first deal with Interscope, maybe if I would have listened and did what they wanted, things would have went differently. You know, you can go back and think about all those things, but none of it matters really because it's the past. So you have to find a way to take all those experiences and grow, which yeah. I think I've been able to. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's so interesting that you, you mentioned that the, you know, the label wanted you to do things that you really wanted, didn't want to do, you know, and, and I agree with you, you know, it, like it makes sense for the business side of things, but it, it really is a shame, you know, that, that the, the label will take this artist that already has a clear sense as to what they do, want to do. And then they completely flip flop it and say, you know what? We want you to do this. We want you to dress this way. We want you to act this way. I mean, the things they ask of people is, is outrageous sometimes. Well, you know, it, it, I really think it depends on the artist because for some types of artists, that's a good thing. And and so, you know, um, if you sign someone, for example, that is a great singer and a great showman, but they're not really a songwriter and they don't really, you know, have a, a point of view when it comes to... Uh, you know, their image or that sort of thing, then, you know, you develop that stuff. That's, you know, all artist development, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. I think when you sign someone based on a collection of music that defines their identity, uh, to then try to find a way to manipulate that, you're going to frustrate any artist at that point. And, and, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm beyond uh, someone giving me direction. I'm not. But um, it's just when you have a situation where you've already defined certain aspects of what you're doing mm -hmm. and you get signed based on that it, it, to try to change that it's kind of odd <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you in the bed. absolutely what has been your biggest challenge so far that's a good question I mean I, I guess my mood is probably my biggest challenge because okay. what happens for me is uh, you know if I don't have a sense of balance mm -hmm. I become very uh chaotic in my mind and, and sometimes a, a bit self-destructive. Okay. What I mean by that is I can't be doing any one thing the same way for too long. So what that means is if I'm making a record, uh, there gets to be a point where you're in the studio, you're looking forward to, to finishing it, and then you listen and it's, you know, there's something, oh, i got to fix that, oh, i got to fix that. And it can get to a point where, you know, uh, enough being in the studio, let me get on stage and play Right. Exactly. And so then, you know, you get out on stage, you're on tour, and then you've been out for two months or whatever it is, and suddenly you start to get a little nuts. You know, you're, you're locked in a, in a bus with a bunch of people, and after a while, you know, you sometimes just want to sleep in your own bed and be home. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, that's, then you know it's time to, to take a break and take some time off and live your life and enjoy things outside of music. And then, you know, after that happens, you might write some songs, you go back and make a record. So my point is, it's a cycle. And oh, yeah. so for me, you know, balancing that is probably the only real challenge. I mean, uh, like I said earlier, my, my goal is to be in a position where I can make music that I love. And I've got that, you know, with the Winery Dogs and uh, other solo records that I've made. So, you know, I've got that covered. Uh, you know, the, the, the challenging things are more personal things, right. you know, just being in the same situation uh, for too long or whatever, you know. I think that's a really good point, though, about the mood because, you know, I mean, and, and the cool thing about it is that a lot of people, you know, I've, I found that they write differently depending on the mood they're in. You know, if they're more angry, then they write, you know, more hard hitting, badass songs. If they're more in, a, you know, a, a happy, like laid back, chill mood, then they'll tend to write more laid back and chill songs. Have you? Yeah, and you know, what it really comes down to as a writer is input and output. And yeah. what I mean by that is, obviously, when you're writing songs, you're, you're, that's output. Yeah. However, you, you can exhaust that quickly and so you have to get away from music to go out and do some other things living whatever that is i mean it can be relationship oriented travel oriented you know something outside of playing and writing so you have that input and then after a while that kind of seeps in and then you have new perspectives so that when you start writing again you have something new to, to write about exactly well, speaking of challenges, we actually have a new challenge for you today because we are up to our segment, the question of the week. Question of the week. 
Listen up, guitar players. Are you looking to take your skills and abilities to the next level? Do you want to be able to play some head bobbing grooves like Richie Kotzen from the Winery Dogs? Well, check this out. Guitarplayback.com is a site loaded with video lessons, jam tracks, licks, David Wallerman's revolutionary map tracks, and a ton of free stuff that'll help you step your game up and play like the pros. Get 50% off your next order by going to guitarplayback.com and entering in the coupon code PODCAST at checkout. That's half off your next order. So what are you waiting for? Guitarplayback.com. Ignite your musical personality. So in this segment, we'll ask our interviewees a new question every week, and they have to think of the funniest answer that they can come up with. To our listeners, write in your questions on our Facebook at facebook.com slash entertainment drive through and our Twitter at eDriveThru, and we just might use it as the question of the week. Now, Richie, are you ready? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, question is, what is one of the funniest or most embarrassing things you've seen or done in the studio or on tour? Uh, well, the first thing that comes to mind is a long time ago, uh, I was on tour, I was the guitar player in the band Poison, mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was a winter tour, and we were, I believe we were in Allentown, Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. and our stage was designed, so in the middle of the stage there was this huge uh, triangle that you, you could walk out on, so I would go out there for certain guitar solos, and Brett would go out there to sing. Mm-hmm. And so for the encore, he used to come out on stage in his boxer shorts. <laughs> and it, one night he came, he came out there, and Bobby and I, the bass player, mm-hmm. uh, walked out on the triangle with him because it was the end of the show, and we all would stand there. And I, we looked at each other, and I happened to glance down at his shorts, and he, he knew exactly what I was thinking. And just like, right away, like, you know, in sync, we grabbed his shorts and pulled them all the way down to his ankle. Oh, and he was standing no. there completely naked, both arms up in the air. And, uh, you know, he said, he, he laughed it off. He said, you know, you could have given me a fair warning. He said, because everything, it was so cold, it was all shriveled up. Oh. <laughs> but uh, it, it was, uh, that was probably the most embarrassing thing. We used to do a lot of silly stuff. Oh, my goodness. That is great. That That's is awesome. So, so, so he wasn't really mad about it. No, no, he he wasn't. <laughs> that's a, was see, that's the best. He didn't, want, I guess he, he, he didn't want us to do it again, you know. Oh, yeah. I, mean. <laughs> I mean, I could imagine he him just being like, you know what, guys, that was a good burn. But, yeah, let's not do that again. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, that's good. But anyway, getting back to the interview, but that was a, that was a great answer. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, w- I wanted to ask you, you know, we've talked about some of the bands that you've been in. You know, we've talked about the Winery Dogs, which you're in right now. We've talked about Mr. Big. We've talked about Poison. H- I mean, how did you get into, you know, bands like Mr. Big and Poison? You know, th- those, I mean, those are big names. Well, uh, I can tell you exactly how the Poison thing happened. I, I honestly never planned on joining any bands because when I uh, got signed, at 18, I started making my own records, and then uh, after I did three records on an independent label, I got signed by Interscope, it's a major label, and, mm-hmm. you know, we had all these plans, and I remember submitting, uh, we had Danny Korchmar, who did The End of the Innocence for Don Henley, mm-hmm. and he was going to produce the record, we had our budget approved, everything, songs picked out, we were going to write a few together, and uh, everything was ready to go, and... All of a sudden, out of nowhere, um, my a and guy basically told me, I'm stopping this because I don't want you making a, a soul rock soul record. Hmm. I, signed, I signed you to be a hard rock artist, and that's what you're going to do. Wow. And yeah. at 21 years old, after living in L.A. Uh, for a year, doing all this writing, co-writing, and then getting one of my favorite producers involved and agreeing to do it, uh, I naturally lost my mind, and right. I freaked out. I told them that they need to drop me and release me from my contract. They didn't know what they were doing with me and all this crazy stuff. And so they actually did drop me, and they they didn't mess with me at all. They let me go free and clear. But around that time, C.C. DeVille left Poison, and the the guy who signed me to Interscope used to A&R Poison when he was at Capitol. Mm -hmm. And he called me and said, listen, he said, I know this is going to sound weird, 
but I really think you should do this. Mm -hmm. And he said that the guys from Poison were calling him about me joining the band. No oh. kidding. And, and obviously that was a complete you know, left turn from what I wanted to do, but I did go out and meet Brett at his house, and I really liked him. And, I, and the way it was presented to me was that they wanted to take the band in a new direction, and they were looking for someone that would write songs and contribute. And so when we started jamming together, it, it, it was fun. It was something that seemed like a good idea for me to do. And my label at the time was like, do this for a year, and when you're done, come back to me. We'll make your record then, and I think you'll have a clearer idea of, of what you want to do as an artist. And right. so by the time I got back to make the back to Interscope, they never resigned me because the label became at the time like very much driven by hip hop mm. and uh, and rap. So they be, they were into a whole other direction. So I I didn't resign with them. I ended up signing another deal with uh, Geffen at the time. Okay. So then I went on doing solo records for years, and then um, in 1999 uh, I was in San Francisco recording with Stanley Clark, mm -hmm. and Eric Martin came to. Um, I went to one of Eric Martin's solo shows, hmm. and then he brought up the fact that uh, that Paul uh, wasn't going to be doing the next Mr. Big record, and would I be interested? And then I met met up with uh, uh, Billy and uh, Pat. Mm -hmm. at my house and we talked and you know it, it was a long time since I had been in a band I mean I left Poison in 93 mm -hmm. and now it was 99 so I thought well it seems like it could be fun I could take a break from myself right uh, for a while and and uh, work with some other guys so I did that okay well unfortunately we are down to the end of our interview but where are places that our listeners can find out more information about you and your band well, you can go to the winerydogs.com and it has all the latest information on our shows and what we're doing. And for me personally, they can go to richiecotson.com or they can go to my Facebook fan site. That's where all of the most current updates, anything that I do, a show or a video comes out, it all shows up on that Facebook site. Excellent. And for more information on Richie Kotzen and the podcast, go to entertainmentdrivethrough.com and subscribe on iTunes. Like and follow us on our Facebook at facebook.com slash entertainmentdrivethrough and our Twitter and Instagram at eDriveThrough. Hi, this is Richie Kotzen, and you're listening to Entertainment Drive Through.